We've been looking at uh, stuff that goes back tens of thousands almost of years, uh, as well as stuff quite recent, and that's exactly what I'll be doing this morning as well, looking at stuff that was built just yesterday, but also stuff that was at least 3,000 years old. And I'd like to do it by uh, using Holland and Sweden, or the Netherlands and Sweden, as an example, and uh, we'll begin with Holland. Um, it's, where's the laser guy? Thank you. Um, the blue, this stuff is below sea level. And uh, so therefore the material that is there is relatively recent. Whereas the older sites are where the green is. Just to locate for you, Amsterdam, oh I love this button here, is right about there. Okay, this, for example, is called Flevoland, and it's only 40 or 50 years old, uh, whereas others of these places have been made land uh, before then. Okay, um, I, I guess I gotta t show you where I live in Holland. I, I, I actually live in Glastonbury. But uh, we have a flat in Holland in Enkhausen, and I've got the uh, we've got the upper floor of this building. And the reason I show Enkhausen, um, I'm going to just but, uh, no, wrong way. Uh, Enkhausen is here, and uh, the reason I'm showing this is because it's on, on one of the oldest dikes in in Holland. As a matter of fact, the street that runs here is called Dijkstraatje. And so it's, um, it's one of the earliest places that was uh, built to get some land in, in a place that was below sea level. And out our window uh, is uh, the Dromedaris, which is a wonderful, wonderful old building. It was actually built in about 1540. And uh, so it's got a million dollar view as well. But it also really, the sun is important there as well as the moon. It's a lovely, lovely town. I can't uh, tell you enough about it. Um, uh, this is also uh, one of the uh, places which is west of Ankhausen, and it's a holy well, uh, Hilo, and uh, that's Karen, my wife, and uh, it's one of the few places in western uh, Netherlands that I've visited. Whereas if we're gonna look at ancient Holland, uh, we've got to be looking at this green area, and we'll be predominantly looking at spaces in here and also up in here in Drenthe. Yes, there are dolmens, I suppose. I think it's always risky to be using the word dolmen anywhere but where they exist, i.e. in this island. Uh, for example, in the United States, I, or in the Western Hemisphere, I heard the word dolmen being used. And that implies that the Celts or the pre-Celts had something to do with the making of them, which I'm not so sure was the case. Uh, in New England, where I did most of my master's work, we call them per perched rocks. But in any event, this is one that looks like something you might find in this land. However, this is more to the point. Hunebeden, giant's graves. Uh, this is called Borger, it's up in Drenthe. It's, uh, it's a whole series of perch rocks, if you will. Marvelous ancient sites. They're probably 3000 BC, so this is the oldest, the oldest uh, uh, material that we'll be seeing uh, in Holland. Here's another Hunebeden, and the next shot is showing what it looks like, how, how far off the ground they are, not. And the problem with these things is, even to this day, there are idiots building fires under them and cracking the stones, just as there are people up at Pretty and the Nine Barrows destroying the wonderful rings that are above there, just out of ignorance. And it's very sad. We've got so few left. Uh, there are a lot of mounds in Holland. Uh, we could call them round barrows, but again, I'm not sure that's the right term, but they look like round barrows. Bronze Age, probably. But I'm more interested in, oh, wait, this isn't in Holland. 
Uh, I'm interested in truncated cones. And we'll see truncated cones both in the Netherlands and in Sweden. But just a quick aside while we're looking at Silbury, because it's a good example. Here I am standing on the West Kennet Long Barrow, and to the left is uh, Silbury. Uh, but it's in this area that I want to draw your attention. Uh, Baby Sill has already been mentioned, but I've been going there for 25 years, and only this year did I learn about Baby Sill. And it's actually not called Baby Sill uh, by the archaeologists. It's called Waden Mound because it's at the end of Waden Hill, which uh, splits Silbury from the West Kennet Avenue. And it's a truncated cone. So uh, it, it's, it's just so close to Silbury. And it is a truncated cone. I think that's a very exciting new find as far as I'm concerned. But in Holland, we have these truncated cones. This is called Tafelberg which is Table Mountain. And uh, the top is indeed flat, just like Silbury Hill. There's even a table there. Uh, <clears throat> even is the spirit of the land. She's a dangerous lady to mess around with. Uh, but she's also Mother Nature at the same time. And uh, nature spirits are connected with her. And you see she lives in what might be called truncated cones. And indeed, we went to her area, and this was a truncated cone. When we were there, kids were sledding down the side of her, of her mound. And uh, so these truncated mounds are found in lots of places. As in addition to Silbury and Holland, we'll see them in Sweden as well. Now, this is modern ancient Holland. Uh, this is a labyrinth. Uh, I'm, it's one of the things that I'm very interested in are labyrinths. I'll talk a little bit more of them as we get into Sweden. But uh, this one was built by my sister-in-law, Sylvia Schluter, and it's in Drenthe, where the Hunebeden are. Uh, and then there's a place called Centrum Athenor, which uh, has various things. They have a labyrinth there and the stone ring. And here's the winter solstice sunset there. And so the astronomy is something that's very uh, important, as we've been hearing again and again in our time together this weekend. Uh, Dordwegen, uh, take a look at this. Look at the lines that are coming together here. One, two, three, four, five, six. They are what might be called dead straight lines. Dordwegen, dead ways. And indeed, the people from the surrounding towns would bring their dead along dead straight roads to the cemetery in the center there. And also right behind are round barrows, which show that they were using this place for burials uh, long before uh, these Dotwegen were uh, active around 1600 uh, BC, uh, CE, common era. Here's another one. Absolutely straight. Uh, here they're coming in. This, this road is coming into the center, to the crossing, where there is a cemetery. Modern. Now, these dead straight roads uh, are also found in Sweden. But let me just talk about dead straight and other things that are connected to those. Uh, there's this thing called a ruler that makes a straight line. And it also means the guy who's running the show. And I say guy usually because it's usually men. And reg is Sanskrit for the king. And these straight lines seem to be uh, something that were part of the patriarchal way of looking at ancient sites. But in any event, let's go to Sweden and take a look at a dead straight road. Uh, this one is uh, at uh, Rosaring, which is early, early Viking. And at the far end, way up at the top, is a charnel house. And they would bring them down. And I'm actually standing on a mound, uh, a series, one of a series of mounds that were uh, used where they buried people. Uh, here you can see again, starting at the top is the charnel house, the dead straight lines, going down to uh, a series of mounds. And also on the left-hand side, you can see labyrinth, labyrinths. <clears throat> now, labyrinths, the mounds are in the background. Uh, labyrinths, 
if you want to build a labyrinth, the most important thing to know about is maintenance. Because if you don't maintain them, they disappear in a hurry. And this one is a 15 circuit, and uh, it disappeared, it's disappearing in a hurry, as you can see. Uh, the, these actually is, is, much, is a bit older than the, uh, the dead straight road there at the Rosoring. It's dated to maybe 500 uh, of the common era. But um, the difference between a labyrinth and a maze uh, was uh, up until around uh, 1990, people didn't make much distinction between the two. But in the year of the maze, uh, a bunch of us got together and decided we'd make one. And the idea is that a maze is a left brain puzzle. It has high walls and it offers you multiple choices. I came to this one before, I'm back here again, I didn't get there so I'll go this way. It's a left brain puzzle, lots of choices. Whereas a labyrinth has low walls, and if you uh, walk to the mouth of it, the beginning of it, uh, then, here, let me go there. Yes. You just follow the path, if you can see it anymore, because, of course, this one's beginning to disappear into the ground. Uh, it takes you to the goal or the center, and then you turn around and walk out. There is a labyrinth here in town, which if you'd like to give it a try, the Tercentennial Labyrinth, the Glastonbury Tercentennial Labyrinth, it's in the St. John's Churchyard, just up the high street a bit on the left. And maybe during lunchtime, you might like to give it a try. You walk in and it's on your right-hand side. But you can see that if you don't maintain it, if you don't strim the grass, if you don't take care of it, it will disappear quite quickly. <clears throat> Uh, the guy who found, who drew this drawing, incidentally, when you look back here, how did he pull that out of that mess? And basically, he, he went around and jabbed a wire coat hanger into the ground and found out where the buried stones were. That's how he got this good a picture of it. Now here is another truncated mound. It's in Gamla Uppsala. And it's where they crowned the kings of Sweden. Uh, in early days. Now, I need to tell you a story about my name. My name is Siegfried Lönegren in Swedish, where my father was born. And he, got, he was Siegfried, and he was named uh, by his Lutheran bishop grandfather. And Saint Siegfried is the patron saint of Sweden. And he apparently converted the first pagan Viking king to Christianity. And so he's a uh, patron saint of Sweden. And I later found out, you want to know where he came from? Glastonbury. <laughs> it's deja vu all over again. Uh, here's another truncated cone, Otters Hogan, and uh, my nephew rolling down the side of it. You can't do that kind of stuff anymore. Um, but this, this is really the Silbury Hill of Sweden, Anans Hög. And it is, um, it's the highest one in Sweden. And uh, you can see this rune stone next to it is a part of a, uh, a, a line of stone row, a stone row. And if you stand on top of, of Annenshög and look out that way, you come to these two Viking ship settings. And they're fascinating things. Annenshög, let's see, Annenshög. Anenshoek is bronze, uh, bronze late Iron Age, and uh, these Viking ship settings have, uh, they're, they're prior to the time of Christ by 500 to 1,000 years. Now, here is uh, myself, and, uh, myself and Dan Matson and two of his friends who are standing at this double Viking ship setting, if you will. Uh, and he flew airplanes above them to get a picture of looking at them from above so he could get a better idea of uh, how they're constructed. Oops, wrong button. Dunk. Uh, and he laid yellow tapes on the ground. There's, there's Anand Hug up here, and here are the ship settings. And he put tapes down so he could do more accurate measurements. Now. <clears throat> A vesica Pisces is when you have two identical circles sharing a common radius. That's not happening here. They're definitely common circles, but uh, they don't share the same radius. So these, these shapes, these vesica shapes, are not vesica Pisces. Um, 
But in any event, fascinating geometry that he found there. Uh, this is looking from the top of the Hoog uh, down towards that big rune stone. And this is a stone row here. So the, the ship settings are over here. And there are all kinds of burial mounds around there as well. Uh, damn, how do I do that? I, I click the clicker. Yeah. This is how a labyrinth uh, is made. Uh, this is a 15-circuit labyrinth at Tibla, right next to Anathug. But you start with a seed pattern like this, and you start at the top of the cross and just go around and around and around. It's like making a spiral. And then it uh, uh, creates this labyrinth. There are seed patterns for three-circuit ones, seven circuit ones, 11 circuits, and there are very few of these 15 circuit labyrinths. Um, do I click it again to get it going again? Yes, there we go, now watch, boom, boom, next one, next one. See how it goes, one to the next. And you're basically making a spiral where you just pick up your pencil occasionally at the end of each turn. 15 circuit, there are very, very few of these. The best one actually is uh, uh, just above Oxford in this country, uh, uh, Troy Town. Uh, maze, as it is so called. But this is the one at Tibla, which is right near Anenshug. And I want to draw your attention to the picture on this sign. There it is. Now, there's something wrong with this picture. It's a, it's a seven circuit labyrinth. It's not a 15 circuit labyrinth. The guy who drew it didn't quite have the idea of what's going on. Uh, another feature that you find in Sweden are tings. Uh, over here, they're sometimes called moots, and uh, there are tings on these islands as well. I've been to several of them. They were Viking-inspired, and basically what they are is neutral turf, where different tribes can come together and uh, resolve what might be called things that are difficult to resolve, moot points. And um, in the United States, they use things called council trees. And the Native Americans would sit under the council trees, which are these, the biggest monarch of the forest, goes up and then all the branches don't go out this way, they go out this way, and this way, and this way. And again, they were used to hold council and resolve moot points. This ting is in Sweden, uh, just north of Stockholm. Again, you can see the rune stones on the uh, right-hand side. And just below there is uh, uh, Jarlabank's Bro, which was a, a bridge on the way built by Jarlabank. And uh, there's, a, there's a very stupid little sign here uh, of uh, speaking runes. Uh, look at the double serpents, by the way. And um, it's basically saying, hey, why not build a bridge? Sounds great. We're with you all the way. Uh, but in any event, I do like these double serpents. I think that's, we've been hearing some about that before this year, uh, th this day. Now, Sweden has more labyrinths than any uh, other than modern labyrinths, uh, more other than modern labyrinths than any other country in the world. And especially if you, if you include the Gulf of Bothnia and Finland and Estonia as well. And they were built uh, by fishermen who, they're right on the coast. The, 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 that Tibla one we saw was Viking. Uh, these were started sort of uh, 1500 and till about the beginning of the last century. And they were walked by, uh, by fishermen for a good wind and a good catch. So they were magical tools that were used by uh, fishermen um, to enhance the possibility of catching stroming and other kinds of fish that they were looking for. Um, one of the problems with building a labyrinth like this is that you can kick the stones real easily. And they fall apart into a maze. And indeed, you can find some of these in Sweden with, that have turned into mazes. And people didn't know how to put them back together again. And there are several fellows who are going around to the islands on the coast of uh, the Stockholm Archipelago and, and others and putting them back into shape. Uh, this one uh, on the left is Borgen, and that is a seven circuit. You can see it quite clearly. 
and then this one is a 15 circuit at uh, Sodra Bergham. Again, you can see how it can disappear if you don't take care of it. Now this one's called Linbaka, and I want to talk a little bit about the earth energies. Um, in the 1970s, when I was working on my master's, um, I came over here to give a talk in, uh, here in England, and I was talking about what I was dowsing, and John Michelle came up to me and said, Sieg, he called me Sieg, um, don't call these things that you're dowsing lays, and because they're not the same. And so I decided I'll, I'll take his advice, and I started calling them energy lays, which when I douse them, they're six to eight feet wide, having a direction of flow and a yang charge. Now, there comes a problem with a term that you will hear me use once today, and I trust you won't hear it again, ley lines. I don't know what a ley line is. When people use the term, are they talking about an alignment of sites, or are they talking about this thing that you douse? Alfred Watkins, who rediscovered these straight alignments, didn't call them ley lines, he called them lays. And um, they don't necessarily run together, although many times they do. Uh, I have a book called Spiritual Dowsing, which is available downstairs, which talks about one lay that I saw that is found in Avery that is four inches wide. You look through, and it's just four inches wide, but it runs quite a distance from the church, through the bank at Avebury, through some stones in the West Kennet Avenue to some round barrows. And there's no energy flowing along them. There's no energy lay flowing along this lay. So they're not one and the same, uh, at least from this dowsing point of view. Now, it's also really important to share with you Sig's hypothesis number one. I, I may have others, but I don't remember them. <laughs> but in any event, I've been pushing this guy for about 20 years, and it's even if they were trained by the same teacher, when dowsing for intangible targets in sacred space, it's really quite probable that no two dowsers will ever find exactly the same thing. This does not play well with science. It's got to be repeatable. But the reality is that we're not talking about dowsing as a scientific tool. Another term for it is called divining. It's a spiritual tool. And like there were lots of, I'm sorry ladies, men who saw God, I'm sure there were women too, but the men got the credit here from about 1500 years before the time of Christ to a thousand after. Their names were like uh, Lao Tzu and Buddha and Krishna and Buddha and Zoroastro and Moses and Jesus and uh, Muhammad. They all saw God. They all saw the one. I don't have a problem with that. But the problem I have is that each one of them came back and told a different story. And if you happen to be a Christian, there's only one way to God. That's through Jesus. But there are over 2,000 denominations, Christian denominations. And if you want to get to heaven as a Methodist, you kneel here. But if you're a Congregationalist, you stand here. Or you listen to the guy in Rome, or, 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 or. There's so many different ways to get to the one, even though it's all through the same dude, Jesus. So we each see the spiritual side differently, and we each douse differently. So for example, we've heard a lot about the Michael and Mary lines. Different dowsers who are intently interested in dowsing for the Michael and Mary lines find them in different places. So that's the way it goes. And don't get disturbed because the next guy doesn't find what you're finding. I trust that's a point that all of you can carry with you. Yes, I'll stop there. Um, in terms of the energies, what I found at a power center, like at this one at Lindbaka, uh, is the energy lays coming through, there's, there's ones that begin and take off, that's called a downshoot, and then some that come through. I almost always find an energy lay running down the major axis of the site and entering out the mouth. That's yang. This is called a dome. 
and uh, it, or a blind spring. And basically, it's primary water. There are two kinds of water. Secondary water, of which we've been experiencing way too much here in Somerset in the last couple of weeks, comes from there and falls to the ground. And if we're lucky, it goes away and gets evaporated and taken back up into the heavens. So it's, it's that kind, again and again, the same water. But primary water comes from there. And it's the result of the, of the processes that happen down in our mom's tummy. And for example, if you have an acid and a base and they come together under heat and pressure, they make a salt plus water. And where does water go in that situation? And the answer is away. And some dowsers, like Billy Gone, feel that there are Amazon-sized rivers that are down, way down. And then they find a crack and they go up and they form Thames-sized rivers under the surface of the earth. And then they find a crack and go up and they form brew-sized rivers. And then they come up and most of them, if they get to the surface, they're called a geyser. Uh, for you in America, that's called a geyser. And a geezer is an old man. But in any event, <laughs> you old geezer, that's me. OK, but in any event, uh, most of them don't get there. They hit an impermeable layer, and they go out as veins, an odd number of veins. And in this dome, as you can see, there are five. And one of the most common characteristics is that one of the veins comes out the mouth. Uh, for example, when I've been dealing Sheila in the gigs, I find one of the veins going right under her vulva. Uh, at Kilpeck, I find not only is she over water, but there's an energy lake coming right into her vulva. So uh, she's a real powerful lady. Uh, this is at Lindbacka. And Sweden is, uh, was under massive pressure from the uh, Ice Age. And when it retreated, it began rising. And uh, as a matter of fact, you can see Oh, the distance from here to the projector away, you can see the beach where it used to be. But it's been rising. And now there's a dinner shipping, which is a new shopping town between there and the sea. So it's rising all the time. But this was a shore labyrinth that fishermen would walk for a good catch and a good wind. Uh, this is on Gotland, uh, an island off the east coast of Sweden. This is an 11 circuit lab labyrinth at Galjeberget, which is Gallows Hill. But again, it's close to where they hanged uh, criminals. Uh, the town of Visby is right next to it. And it also, but it is right next to the sea. And so fishermen would walk it for a good catch and uh, a good wind. It's an 11 circuit labyrinth. This one is at Froyal Shirka. And the most fascinating thing for me is take a look at what's on that labyrinth. A pump. There's water under it. Uh, so this shows that connection between labyrinths and water. Um, Froyas, uh, it's probably uh, 500 years after the time of Jesus. And Froyas used to be Freya. And Freya is the goddess of love. And so this probably was a site that was sacred to her. And then it was Christianized, because right next to it is a church. Sherka means church. Now, there are ship settings, or ship settings, a skep setting, uh, in Gotland. Uh, beautiful vesica-shaped ones. Um, and again, these are uh, 500 to 1,000 years BC or BCE. Um, this is probably my famous one, my, my favorite one. This is Ale Stener, uh, which is in Skåne, which is in southern Sweden, uh, on the eastern side of the, uh, uh, into the Baltic. And uh, it's a beautiful one. And check this out. This is a winter solstice sunrise at Ale Stener. The astronomy is there. OK. Now, my, bit, my grandfather, Lutheran bishop grandfather, had a street named after him. And these are my children, only they're now uh, 39 and just having a baby. So they, it was a while ago. But here's little Jordan standing by a rune stone and the round barrow behind. Uh, the, the things are intermingled, although it's interesting. When I first went to Sweden, they didn't know a heck of a lot about their prehistory. It's almost as if the Lutherans came in and just cut off that 
past, which happened in more than one country, I'm afraid. Now, Midsommar is on June 24th. And uh, does anybody know who the saint is who has his or her birthday on the 24th? John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist's job was to say that Jesus is coming. And that's the first day, if you're paying very good attention, that you will see that the sun is going away. You've got to pay real good attention. But it's the, uh, for about three or four days, the sun rises dead in the same place, it seems, and yet uh, in the northeast. And then on the 24th, if you're watching very closely, you can see this beginning to go away. And then you go to the diametrically opposite end of the year, the 24th or 5th of December, and you have the sun coming back. So John the Baptist and Jesus balance each other throughout the year. And midsummer is uh, party time in Sweden. And uh, here uh, is a stang, which is a word for staff over here, but a midsummer stang uh, is used and danced around and they sing stupid songs. I, I don't think they used to be stupid, but uh, now they sort of are going to church and singing songs and stuff. Uh, but it's a fun, wonderful time. Now, uh, I told you about fishermen walking these for a good catch <coughs> and uh, good wind. <coughs> this is one that some friends and I, of mine and I built a number of years ago on one of the islands in the archipelago. And it's called a trollfanger, troll catcher. Now trolls are Swedish leprechauns. They're tricksters. And fishermen sure as hell don't want tricksters in the boat with them when they're out fishing and having good wind and a good catch. So what they used to do would be they'd walk into the labyrinth and trolls love games. So they'd follow them into the, into the labyrinth. And when the fishermen got to the center, they'd turn around and haul ass out of there just as fast as they could go, jump in their boats and take off. So the, the trolls wouldn't um, be in there messing them over. Now, when you have a boat and a line behind and the boat is moving forward, what is that called? Trolling. We're not talking about trawling. Trawling digs up the bottom, but trolling is that. And it's interesting because, of course, that line is Theseus's string that he used to get out of the uh, so-called labyrinth. I would call it a maze and the minotaur. But it's fascinating how these uh, stories go on. Many Swedish labyrinths are called Trojaber. And uh, the best labyrinth magazine is Kerdroya, which is based on a Welsh uh, word, the turns of Troy. So Troy seems to be a very important thing, the walls of Troy, and how to get through the walls of Troy. So this is just a little taste of what's going on in the Netherlands and Sweden. Uh, I would end with an unsolicited testimonial of my latest book. Uh, it's called Earth Mysteries Handbook, Holistic Non-Intrusive Data Gathering Techniques. Now, dear friends, uh, this is a uh, re massively revised uh, edition of a report I made in about 1985 to the American Society of Dowsers and, the, and NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association, of some work that a bunch of us did in um, New England on underground chambers where we looked for astronomy, where they oriented, where these underground chambers there, uh, notice I didn't say souterrains or fugus, but that's what they'd be called over here. Um, and uh, they're oriented towards significant astronomical events, many times through a notch in the hills. Uh, they're built using sacred geometry, and they certainly are on Earth energy power centers, which for me, this is the way this blind man sees the elephant, is with domes of primary water and energy lays, one usually exiting out the mouth. Now, many of these underground chambers, or these underground chambers were referred to by archaeologists and anthropologists as colonial root cellars. And they would make a good place to store your crops in the winter. There's no doubt about that. And undoubtedly, many colonists did use them 
for that purpose. But there are well over 100 of these chambers in New England and the Hudson River Valley. And uh, we found that 40% of them that we doused, uh, that we visited, had significant astronomical orientation, usually either towards the quarter days or the cross quarter days, and uh, were built using sacred geometry and had earth energy power centers there. Now, some of them are clearly what are called receiving vaults, which is where you put um, you put people in the middle of winter when the ground's too hard to deal through the permafrost, through the frost. And so they're holding tanks, if you will, until the spring comes when they can bury people. But 40% of the ones that we visited had all three, archaeoastronomical orientation, sacred geometrical uh, significance, and uh, the earth energy power centers. The sacred geometry was taken, basically, you took three widths, added them up and divide by three, take three lengths, add them up and divide by three, and divide the smaller into the larger, and you get a ratio of something to one. And that something, 40% of the time, was either phi, 1.618 to one, or was a square, or it was a double square, which is uh, uh, 10 by 20, if you will, the king's chamber is a double square. Uh, it had those, a handful of sacred geometrical ratios. So in any event, this is a, a book that uh, is available now on iTunes. If you're a Mac user, you can download it onto your iPad. And within a week or two, it should be available also in a book called Kindle, which is made by Amazon. And uh, in any event, uh, that will be available. Actually, downstairs, I have two books available. One is called um, Spiritual Dowsing, which I wrote in about 1985. And it still pretty well represents where I come from on these things. And also, Labyrinths, Ancient Myths, and Modern Uses. I think the subtitle of that Labyrinth book really tells you why I'm here. Yes. I do honor the scientific investigation that goes on. Yes, I do value the information I get from people called researchers. I'm not one. I'm a seeker. That's why I live here in Glastonbury. I intend to be one step closer at least to my maker when I die than I am today. And sacred spaces are tools that can help you do that. And I think it's very clear that the inhabitants of this island and of Peru and of Mexico and New England and Holland and Sweden were all interested in the same thing as our sacred spaces all over the world. Thank you very much.